Anxiety is epidemic in dogs right now. I know that's a bold statement, but I stand by it. And I also don't think there is any coincidence in the fact that the gut health in our dogs is also really incredibly poor right now, which even if we're, you know, we can't see our dog's gut health. So if we're just looking at the massive increase in illnesses and diseases in our dogs, there is a direct correlation to gut health. You may not know that that same gut health correlates to anxiety. And so, yes, I stand by the fact that I just said anxiety is epidemic in our dogs right now. So if you have a dog that has any form of anxiety, and we're going to talk about lots of different forms of anxiety in today's episode, because I think a lot of people look at a dog with anxiety and immediately think like this crazy, can't control themselves, <laughs> crazy, can't control themselves, separation anxiety type of anxiety. But there are a lot, a lot of other forms of anxiety. Some of them may be really difficult for pet parents to notice. So we're, today we're going to talk about a lot of different signs and symptoms of anxiety in our dogs. And we're going to talk about some things we can do to combat the anxiety that your dog is feeling. You're not going to want to miss a single moment of today's episode, whether your dog right now today has anxiety or you're ever planning on owning another dog again in your life, because it, I think is just getting worse and worse and worse. And I feel like it's inevitable. At some point, we are going to encounter a dog with anxiety. My dog is no exception. I'm going to tell you about that in just a minute. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Okay, we're back and we are talking about anxiety in dogs. There is so much that I'm going to jam pack in today's episode because anxiety is complex. It is way more complex than we really give it credit for. And I'm going to try, I'm going to do my best to unpack that in today's episode, but I'm just going to really quickly give you a glimpse into my life and how anxiety has affected my dog, Kimberly. Now, of course, I could go on and on and on talking about anxiety in humans. That's not what this podcast is about. If you I can give you some recommendations. If you have questions or concerns or you want to learn more about anxiety and how to handle your own anxiety, definitely reach out to me on Instagram because I have, believe me, I've got a, a good bank of resources there. But okay, so my dog, Kimberly, we adopted her in uh, March 2016. March 2016. At the time, we were told she was about two and a half years old. And so that that is important to the story. The fact that we had adopted her and her age, she was already over two years old. That's important for some reasons we're going to talk about a little bit later on in the episode, but she had crazy separation anxiety. It wasn't to the point where she was harming herself, um, really not even destroying a lot of... Some dogs with separation anxiety can have pretty serious issues with damaging and destroying property. They will... Some dogs have gone so far as to literally bust through windows and glass panes and doors to get out of whatever confinement they are in. Even if it's an entire huge house, it's still in their mind a confinement. Some dogs will chew and gnaw on baseboards and uh, door moldings. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of destruction that could be happening. And in that destruction, 
they can harm themselves. I have seen some really, really graphic pictures where even the tiniest little scrapes and cuts on a dog from where they have accidentally hurt themselves in trying to escape whatever uh, confinement they are in have has left like massive amounts of blood all over the place because they're just frantic and going all over the place and the blood is getting everywhere. So fortunately, my dog Kimberly was not quite to that level. Thank goodness, because, whew, you know, her separation anxiety is one of the reasons that I, I don't want to say got into dog training. I kind of had started getting into dog training a little bit before adopting her, um, but it really, <laughs> I took it a lot more seriously. I went down the rabbit hole in the deep end learning everything I could about separation anxiety specifically, which honestly gives you a lot of insight into anxiety in general. She was, she could like, she couldn't hold still. She screamed bloody murder. She's she, when she screams, she sounds like a woman screaming. It's, it's so sad and also kind of funny at the same time, because you don't expect that noise to come out of a dog. <laughs> Um, but she would scream and scream and scream anytime we left. And so I really had to dig in deep to how to help her through this because who wants to live like that? Right. And we can go down the rabbit hole of, you know, the stress hormone cortisol and the detrimental effects on the body with when that is prolonged and extended because you know cortisol is a very very necessary hormone we need it um we have needed it since the beginning of time it's it's very important it plays a very important role but we're not supposed to live in a state where cortisol production is constant and that's what's happening with a lot of dogs who are living in this state of anxiety granted there are lots of different levels of anxiety. And so maybe a dog with not so severe anxiety, but a little bit is going to have some production of cortisol, like on a steady drip almost. Right. And then these dogs with like, say this really severe separation anxiety have these moments, these, um, events in their life where huge influxes of cortisol is being produced in the body. We know, and the Forever Dog Book is a really great resource for um, studies on the effects of cortisol, as whether it is like this slow, steady drip forever and ever and ever. And these, I see it really, really commonly in a lot of smaller dogs, like think chihuahuas and things like that, where they just kind of constantly live with this low level anxiety all the time. And they're always on alert and always like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And then, you know, other dogs who are pretty chill a lot of the time and then have these huge spikes in cortisol when events happen. Neither is good for longevity. Neither is good for really living in a state of like a thriving state because there is some detrimental effect, I think, on the um, immune system, you know, well, the body in general, which I mean, the immune system is a huge part of that. So, you know, when we're, con I mean, think about you when you're really, really stressed and it's like, there's this constant stress, 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 you are much more susceptible to getting sick and our dogs are kind of in, in that same boat. So cortisol is just one topic <laughs> surrounding anxiety that is very important to bring up. So I wanted to bring it up, but not something that people see externally, right? So you're not, when you see your dog having some sort of anxiety, whether it's low level or high level or anywhere in between, our minds aren't thinking, oh, look at all the cortisol they're producing, right? That's not how we don't see it. So we don't think about it, but it is important to talk about it because it is not good for longevity. And we, of course, we want them to live 
like long, healthy, happy lives. They are such incredible beings that bring us so much joy and pleasure and stability and calm and just like they make our lives so much better. We obviously want to give them the best life possible. And so that is why I had to bring up the topic of cortisol when we're talking about anxiety. So I I went off the deep end in studying separation anxiety in dogs. And so if you look at, say, my my online dog training course, I do have quite a bit of information in there about separation anxiety specifically because it is something that I am very familiar with. I am not that person that or that dog trainer that is like try, out here trying to create, you know, robot dogs. That is not me. I'm, you know, if you go through the my online dog training course, you're getting like really, I think (laughs) really a lot of tips and tricks to yes, train with your dog. You're going to get a lot of, you know, basic cues or commands, whatever you like to call them. I don't like the word commands, but I think we've talked about that in other episodes. So I'm not going to rehash all of that. Um, you're getting a lot of you know, with positive reinforcement, of course, you're getting this bonding with your dog, right? And it's really setting you and your dog up for this really wonderful, like harmonious relationship more so than, more so than like, I need my dog to always listen and be on command. And yeah, of course we do we always want our dog to listen, blah, blah, blah. But it's not like a, not like corporal, right? It's this like harmonious l- you know, living (laughs) this wonderful life with each other and having a good understanding of each other, providing some structure in their life. And then of course, you know, there are some behavioral challenges that we get into in the course as well, such as separation anxiety, we go over crate training, you know, different things like that. But Kim is really why (laughs) that course kind of developed the way it did. And today, I don't want to say that she never has it. I think she, you know, there is some low level anxiety from time to time. Um, and that's something that we just can, like, we understand about her. We continually work with, with her. Um, we are always trying to make sure she feels calm and confident. Confidence is huge. We're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get into some of the things we can do for anxiety. But I want to first give you some of the signs of anxiety to look for, especially in these dogs that have like a low level anxiety. I think so many pet parents don't recognize it, don't really know what it is. They can't, they see that, okay, maybe their dog is a little off. Maybe they just think they're, that's their dog and they're not really equating that oh, this is anxiety and I really should do something about it. So if we can identify it and that allows us, you know, this this ties in so perfectly with um, pet health coaching and holistic, a uh, holistic health approach because we don't want to just continually throw band-aids on symptoms, right? We want to be able to identify the underlying root cause and help to get that Re, you know, like resituated, rework it, and so that it's working properly. That's what we want to do with anxiety as well. So it's so important to be able to identify it. So let's go through some of the signs. Some of these are pretty easy to miss. Um, oh, just by the way, really quickly before I do that, to give you an idea of what I'm what I'm talking about regarding anxiety in dogs. Of course, we've talked already a lot about separation anxiety. Um, But I mean, boredom, anxiety, frustration causes anxiety. Um, For some dogs, loud noises cause anxiety. Um, Having new visitors, being thrown into new experiences. These all can have low grade anxiety for your dog, can also progress Um, over time, if they're not properly treated, handled, can 
really progress into more extreme fears and phobias. Um, some dogs are going to have thunderstorm phobias. That's actually something relatively newer that I have been dealing with with my dog, Kimberly. Um, it has progressed with her to the point where it's not just the lightning and thunder, like she senses the change in barometric pressure. And oftentimes, no when a thunderstorm is coming before I do. <laughs> um, so that makes it a little bit more difficult, but we're working with it. Fireworks, a big one. Um, and I, I think I talked about this not long after we moved to uh, um, Texas. I did not realize. I don't know what rock I was living under. I knew that there were, you know, everybody sets off fireworks for 4th of July, right? I knew that. I didn't know people set off fireworks for New Year on New Year's Eve for New Year's. And so that caught us really off guard. Um, and I think also sent us, th that was the trigger moment that sent us down the path of thunderstorm phobia for Kimberly as well. Um, so again, something we are working on, something newer we are working on, but there are so there's so many different forms of anxiety in dogs. And this is kind of where I was telling you earlier, it's important to know that we adopted Kimberly when she was already over two years old. She was roughly two and a half. And so we have no idea how or if she was even socialized as a puppy. And that is one of the most important things we can do while raising a puppy. Of course, you know, we can talk about all the health stuff, which we do talk about in other episodes, you know, getting them on a species appropriate diet, minimal vaccinations, um, not using a lot of chemicals, all those different things. Um, hopefully not early spay and neuter, uh, though, you know, different situations. We had a whole episode on that as well. In case you missed it, you can go back and listen to that. But proper socialization as a puppy sets up the dog to hopefully not have any, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a pipe dream to say never, ever, ever have anxiety in life, right? Like life is about ups and downs and anxiety can and will happen, but to put them on the path where they're not living in a constant state of anxiety and, um, anxiety is much more easily, like they understand, they understand how to manage and get through, um, stressful situations better. So if you have a puppy, please make sure you are properly socializing them. And that does not mean taking them to the dog park and throwing them in with a bunch of other dogs. Yes, getting them used to other dogs is part of socialization, but there is so much more to socialization, getting them used to different textures, getting them used to different environments, different sounds. So much going on with socialization it is much more than just taking your dog to the dog park. Um, but again, not what we're talking about today. <laughs> so let's talk about some signs and symptoms of anxiety in dogs. And again, some of these are not going to be super straightforward, but let's, let's get into that. So shaking, trembling, pacing, walking in circles. These are certainly signs of anxiety. Uh, yawning, especially if they're frequently doing it or for an extended period of time, that is definitely a sign of anxiety. Compulsive behaviors um, like licking themselves, possibly licking the floor, licking the walls, um, excessive barking, pacing around, chewing, digging. That is something that Kim likes to do when she is really stressed out. Um, if I can get her to go outside, if there's a thunderstorm or fireworks, then she doesn't always want to go outside. And I get that um, because that is much louder outside, um, but she will go outside and start digging. And it's it's kind of a, almost a little bit of a, of a release, if I can talk, uh, a release of some of that pent up energy and stress. Like, it's like they need to do it. It's almost like this compulsive need to, I've got to get some of this energy out of my body. Um, same with chewing. Shutting down, acting super depressed, uh, diarrhea. So this can be, diarrhea can, I mean, there are so many things that, that cause diarrhea that it, it's like, this is on every list, but understand it happens. And I know, in fact, when Kim has, when my dog Kim has, um, an episode of anxiety generally around thunderstorms or fireworks. She may not even eat 
for a day or two. Like her stomach is in knots. She will have diarrhea, maybe not in the moment, but it messes up her stomach so much that she doesn't want to eat for a day or two and there will be diarrhea involved. Um, their ears will be pulled or pinned back. They might not be able to control their bladder, so have some urine dribbling, increase um, in whining and howling. Their heart rate and panting is going to be really increased as well. This is a completely involuntary, involuntary response. It's not something they have any control over when they do that. Um, drooling, smacking their lips, um, they will hide behind you. For, they'll, they'll sometimes get behind furniture. Um, one time Kim got under my bed, which is something she never, ever does. So they will try to hide. Um, for some dogs, hyperactivity, they might you know, be nudging you a lot because they're like, help me, help. It's like a help me, help me, help me. I, I don't like this feeling. I need to get rid of this feeling, right? And they are asking you for help. Um, lowering and tucking their tail, that's big for a lot of reasons uh, for dogs, not just, but I mean, yes, anxiety, new situations, all kinds of stuff, being scared. Um, they might have destructive behaviors. We talked about that earlier and even increased shedding, uh, which is pretty interesting, but again, a very involuntary response, a physiological response that they have absolutely no control over. So let's take a really quick break. And when we come back, we will talk about how we can help our dog with anxiety. Today's episode is brought to you by the Furry Family Coach Dog Training. Train your dog in the comfort of your own home and on your schedule with video instruction from me. Learn the foundations of training, teach basic cues to your dog, and explore solutions to behavioral issues all inside of this video-based online training course. Go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to see you on the inside. Welcome back. We are talking about anxiety in our dogs and we just talked about uh, some of the symptoms, what we actually see on the outside that our dogs express when they are experiencing anxiety. And now we're going to talk about what we can do about it, right? Before uh, we talk about what we can do about it, I want to get into some of the things we should not be doing with our dogs. So we obviously want to get to the bottom of whatever is making our pet anxious, that is the goal because if we can get to the bottom of it, then we can fix the root cause. There are also some, some instances where you are inadvertently uh, the source of your dog's stress and anxiety. And I want to talk about those first and get them out of the way. This is not meant to trigger anybody. If you feel triggered, uh, you know, <laughs> I, what I really want to say is don't blame me. It's because you know, something needs to change and you're realizing it. And that is okay. That is called growth. Um, and that is what we are here for. I'm not in any way trying to blame or shame anyone. It is all about learning how to do better and then acting in accordance with what we have learned, right? So if this applies to any of you, take this as a an aha moment to do better for your pets. Um, Especially, guys, I, you know, we talked about this a minute ago. Positive reinforcement is the way to go. So if you are using any sort of punishment-based training, if you, you know, think that, you know, corporal punishment discipline is the way to go with your dogs, that is absolutely 100% a sign of uh, um, an underlying source of stress for your dog. There should not be any yelling, hitting. We should not be using any aversives like shock collars or choke collars, prong collars. None of this should be, this is only causing a breakdown in the bond that you and your dog should be having with each other. I've talked about that a lot in earlier episodes. 
of the podcast. So I highly recommend you go back um, to some of those episodes where I break down the science of why positive reinforcement training um, is really the only way to go with your pet. There's there is a lot of science behind it, um, which is why I chose to learn positive reinforcement methods when I became a dog trainer. Um, but what are some other common triggers that we could inadvertently be doing with our dog? One is unwanted attention. So randomly waking them up from a nap or being forcibly hugged, kissed, or held. Not all dogs like this. Yeah, okay, some dogs may like, may enjoy it in certain moments from certain people. Not all dogs, not all the time. These are sources of stress. Um, not letting your dog be a dog. My gosh. <laughs> not giving them the opportunity to be a dog. They have both the need to be a dog, and then there are certain breeds that have certain needs as well, like herding breeds. Yeah, there are some really high energy, high drive dogs, uh, breeds of dogs that need outlets for their energy, that what to do what they were bred to do. Um, exposure to strange and unfamiliar objects, animals, or people. Should we have exposure during socialization? Yes, it should always be very intentional. And we should never put them in a situation where they are being flooded. Um, if you're not familiar with the word flooding, it is where we completely immerse, what in this situation, a dog, in something that they are uncomfortable with. So if your dog doesn't like dogs and you force them into a dog park with a ton of dogs, yeah, they may shut, they may not react. And you think you're making progress. In fact, their body is shutting down because they are so overwhelmed. That is called flooding. And it is very counterproductive to any positive training that you're doing with your dog. Um, moving changing routine, people coming and going from the house. Like if you have a teenager that just graduated high school going off to college, that is a stressful event for your dog as well. And then separation from their people, from their family, from pets in the home. When another pet passes away, that can also be really, really stressful. And some of these we can't help, right? And I say we can't help because they are just parts, facts of life, like your teenager going off to college or another uh, pet in the home passing away. These things happen. There are things we can do to help our dogs better cope with these situations. So uh, again, I just talked about avoiding um, abrupt desensitization, uh, which is flooding. So we definitely don't want to cause flooding to happen in our dogs. Uh, so what, what can we do? We need to, first off, meet them where they're at. Understand that they are not doing anything to make us feel a certain way or behave a certain way. They are, they, the only thing they know how to do is attempt with everything they do in their life, attempt to get their needs met. That's the, like anything your dog does, boil it down to that fact. They are only trying to get their needs met. What is their need in that situation? Well, it could be food. It could be attention, affection. They could need to go out and go potty. What, like there's a lot that could be going on in any situation that you could bring up, but that's really what we have to boil it down to. Whatever behavior your dog is expressing what is the underlying need that your dog is trying to address? If we can do that, if we can stay calm and rational in the moment and say, okay, what is their need and how do we get that need addressed? For something as serious and severe as separation anxiety, again, there's this whole blueprint <laughs> of things we can do to help our dog through these really stressful situations. But in general, we want to help keep their nervous system calm. We want to, as I talked about at the very beginning of this episode, um, the gut plays a huge role in anxiety. So feeding a species-appropriate diet is a really good foundation for that. It may be more complex than that 
for some dogs, it may not just be feeding a species appropriate diet. We may need to do more to help the gut heal. But in general, like that's a really good foundation to get them on an incredible diet to balance out the microbes in the gut so that their body is much better equipped to handle stress in the first place. Providing them a calm environment, helping them to regulate their nervous system. You're probably noticing as of yet, I have not mentioned any sort of supplementation. There are there are supplements that we can bring into the equation to help especially as we are working with our dog to help rewire some of the maybe thought processes that they have that they're going through that are leading them down this path to anxiety. Um, it can it can take time. So sometimes we do need to add certain supplements to help us get through it. In very severe cases, we might even need to add pharmaceuticals. I don't love to do that. Y'all know me. That is not my favorite thing. It is certainly not my go-to for anything, but it is a tool that we have in our toolbox and sometimes it is necessary, especially with these really severe separation anxiety cases, right? Uh, we can we can do things like playing calming music for our dogs. One of the most important things we can do for our dogs is making sure they are getting plenty of exercise, both mental and physical. This is something that is so often overlooked that I really want to like pause for a moment and restate. One of the best things we can do for a dog with anxiety, regardless of the level or type of anxiety that they are dealing with, is making sure that they are getting plenty, an adequate amount of both mental and physical exercise. So if I had to break it all down for you in just a couple quick sentences, because I know this podcast is getting long. My solo episodes aren't usually this long, but as I said, anxiety at the beginning, <laughs> anxiety is a very complex topic and I want to kind of boil it down to for you. Yes, anxiety is complex. We are dealing with the hormone cortisol, which is not good um, for extended periods of time for or like in large amounts, not good for longevity. One of the number one things we can do for our dogs that are experiencing any form of anxiety is making sure they are getting adequate amounts of mental and physical exercise. Top that off with positive reinforcement training. Top that off with calming their nervous system. Maybe add in some natural supplementation like, I love, love, love me some essential oils for this. Veterinary grade essential oils, especially Animalio, shout out to them. Um, I absolutely love the work that Dr. Melissa Shelton is doing with Animalio. Calmamile is a blend that she has that is incredible. Um, I also really love a high quality, full spectrum hemp extract. Y'all know CBD dog health is my jam. I love it. I use it. I use it on my dog. I use it on my cats. You heard me say I use, I use it for me too. Love it. Love it. Love it. It helps regulate the nervous system but it does so much else in the body as well. Um, I don't want to get into everything CBD does in this episode, but know that it can be very, very beneficial with these. And these are all, these are natural things we can do. Feeding a species appropriate diet to help balance the gut microbiome. Because as we've talked about in the past, we think the brain controls the body. And in some regards, it does. But the microbes in the gut, they control the brain. So we need to really take care of our dog's gut health, not just for their physical health, but also their emotional health and well-being. So that is what I would boil this all down to, is getting right. Like, just get getting right with, with you know, more providing your, oh, oh. How could I forget? You guys, grounding. Oh my goodness, this could be a game changer for some of you who have tried so many things. 
Now, our dogs in general are going to get more time outside than and they're like bare feet, paw pads, touching the ground, touching dirt, right? They're going to get that more so than, say, our cats or even us. Grounding can be really beneficial. Again, <laughs> we can get into the weeds on this because making sure that it is a healthy soil can make it even more beneficial. Like we, re if we can get our dogs in contact every day with healthy soil, that can also be incredibly beneficial. And I think potentially another reason for that digging behavior. Yes, when our dogs are digging, they are getting out excess energy that they need to get out. It's just like flowing through their body, right? Especially if they are in an anxiety state is just pulsating in their body and they need to get it out. And so they're going to start digging. But guess what? When they dig, they're also getting all that wonderful, wonderful um, like ecosystem that is living in the ground, in the soil, and can be very, very beneficial for their overall health as well. So glad I thought of that last minute because I, I definitely want to make sure that I am giving you as much well-rounded information as possible. But that in a nutshell is kind of how we at least start out. Every dog is different. Every situation is different. We may need, you know, when I'm working with a dog, I, I almost know, like, yes, I have this framework that we just talked about um, when dealing with anxiety, but every dog is different and we can't, they, they're not all going to go at the same pace. We're not going to be able to get everything on board at the same time. They're not going to feel better at the same pace. Everything is a little bit different. So having this framework is great and I hope this was helpful and beneficial. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to share it with your uh, friends and family who also have pets, especially ones who may be struggling dealing with anxiety. With that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off, tell you, please, please, please have the best day ahead. Give your pets some extra love from me. Until next week, bye guys. <coughs>